Hello, everybody, um, and welcome. I hope you all had time for a good lunch break. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this Liber 2021 uh, online session, which is called Hand in Hand, Supporting Strong Open Access Communities. Uh, my name is Simone Kortekaats, and I'm very happy to be the moderator of uh, this session. Um, first, some uh, session ground rules. Um, we'll be running a live Q&A at uh, the end of the session, after all uh, presenters have given their talk, but I'll keep uh, an eye on questions coming in and if there is time in between, uh, questions uh, in between. Um, please send your questions uh, through the chat window at uh, any time. Uh, following the online conference, you will receive a link uh, to a short uh, survey. Please fill it out. Uh, we welcome your feedback. And finally, if you miss anything uh, because of technical issues or um, uh, someone ringing at your door, don't worry. Uh, we are recording this session and we'll send you the recording and slides after the session finishes. Um, in the, today's uh, session, we will hear uh, presentations uh, from um, Celeste Feather and Heather Rosen from uh, Lyraces. Um, they come from uh, the United States. Um, the second presentation will come from Germany, um, uh, Helena Brinken and uh, Andreas Kirchner. And the third, uh, third presentation uh, comes from the Netherlands. Uh, Hans de Jonge from the Dutch Research Council and Bianca Kramer, Jeroen Sondervan and um, uh, Utrecht University Library. Um, these three presentations will give an overview of what's happening around open access in United States, Germany and the Netherlands. And it is great to have three perspectives on, uh, on, uh, on this issue. Um, Okay, I'd like to uh, hand over now to uh, our first uh, presenter, um, he, um, Celeste and Heather. You can take over now uh, the presentation. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much. My name is Hannah Rosen. My colleague Celeste Feather and I are excited to talk to you about Lyricist research and an inclusive approach to open access in the United States. So a little background, Lyricist is a national level consortium based in the United States. And this is a map of all of our members very tightly clustered around the US. We are not the national consortium because that does not exist in the United States, but we do have a wide reach serving over a thousand predominantly academic libraries as well as archives and museums. Well, we provide many different services, including open source software hosting, consulting, and professional development. One of our oldest and core programs within Lyricis is, like our European counterparts, licensing and negotiation for electronic resources on behalf of our libraries. And like our European counterparts, that has expanded to supporting open access programs. Our work at Lyricis with open access programs began in 2014 with the first phase of the scope three program for open access journal articles in high energy physics. And since then, we've continued to add new, but I will say predominantly European open access programs into the content portfolio, including Open Library of the Humanities, Reveal Digital, and Knowledge Unlatched. These offers are made available to our member community, as I said, of over a thousand libraries. And due to our administrative capabilities, we also frequently serve as the national U.S. contact point for certain OA programs, and therefore we reach beyond our association's members to serve the entire U.S. higher education community. So that's a little background about us and where we started, and I just want to give one other piece of background information sort of about the U.S. environment because it's, it is very unique. 
So if you look at the left side, um, support, the uh, composition of four-year and graduate institutions in the U.S., about 77 percent or about 1,400 are smaller institutions that offer baccalaureate and master's degrees. And only about 23 percent, so a little less than a quarter of all institutions, are offered doctoral degrees. But if you look at the right-hand pie chart, that the amount of funding provided by those institutions is essentially flipped. The <laughs> doctoral institutions are spending 80% of all library expenditures, and traditionally that extends to open access as well. So one of the things that we really, really wanted to do last year was to better understand our open access environment. Was it predominantly doctoral universities that were supporting open access? What were the motivations for supporting open access? What kinds of open access programs were we doing? And so we sent out a survey to our members and our larger community, which was ended up turning into this Lyricist 2020 Open Content Survey Report. Um, and the findings from this survey really influence our decision making around our open access strategies. So I'm going to tell you a couple of the high level results that we got from the survey. One is we wanted to know, do libraries have an open content policy? Because we wanted to understand you know, how entrenched decision making was around open content. We didn't say open access specifically because we were trying to use sort of a buzzword less survey to get as much participation as possible. So open content basically means any information that can be accessed without paywalls. We had sections that focused on open access publishing specifically later on, but at the beginning, we just wanna know, do you have any policies surrounding open content? And looking at the responses, you know, 25% said they had an informal policy and 24% said they had a formal policy. This means that approximately 50% of respondents have some form of policy, but that's, it doesn't really indicate any sort of majority of adoption, especially if only tw basically a quarter of respondents have a formal policy. It means that open content, you know, despite the fact that open access has been circulating in our language for almost 20 years now, um, the US is still very fluid in terms of our approaches to open content and people are still trying to figure out their library's role in this space. We also really wanted to know, does your library financially support outside open access initiatives? So basically that meant, does your library support basically contributing money to OA programs such as Knowledge Unlatched, um, Annual Review, Subscribe to Open, Open Library of the Humanities, that kind of thing. And predominantly, no, 53% of respondents said they do not support open access initiatives and only 30% said yes and 14% had no idea. So that was a little, that was surprising, but it didn't stray too far from sort of what we had seen in terms of support in the initiatives that we had already been supporting. But more interestingly, we asked, does your library provide financial support for APCs and we had initially been asking, do you financially support APCs? We wanted to know if they did it for fully open publishers or for hybrid publishers as well. But a minority of respondents, 35% of institutions indicated that they supported APC initiatives overall. So this indicated to us that while APCs are used to support a common business model for OA journal publishing, that model does not appear to be broadly supported within the United States. It justified our previous, perhaps not, uh, you know, our, our previous somewhat intentional support of non-APC crowdfunded and subscription models. And it encouraged us to continue critically looking at future initiatives to make sure they suited the US academic market, that we didn't have to settle for supporting APC initiatives if we thought there were other kinds of models that would better serve our members. We also asked about different 
kinds of non APC open access initiatives do you know we asked do people support outside repositories we asked if they support open access monographs we asked if they supported non APC specific models as I said such as open library of the humanities or subscribe to open and the majority of active supporters and I'll point out only 30% of respondents said they did financially support open access initiatives. But each non AP within that subgroup, most institutions uh, supported all of the suggestions that we put out there. They supported the books, they supported the non APC models, they supported the repositories. No one model for open content appeared to be dominant within the United States. The majority of active supporters appear to take a multifaceted approach. So for us, this really encouraged us to think about one focusing on content that content seemed to be the driver for us open access participation and also to not be afraid to be approached or work with many different open access initiatives that follow many different models those different models were not going to deter our members so as i said we we gained some core feedback from this survey and some of those takeaways really influenced what ended up being our pandemic initiatives as i said those takeaways led us to a new philosophy we respect the diversity of open models and we need many approaches to support the diversity of scholarship the u.s in terms of library support is a messy place and we need to embrace the mess because it allows us to get support from many different kinds of stakeholders and we focus on programs that create opportunities for diverse libraries and institutions to engage as i said historically the doctoral universities are driving all of the financial support for library services and for open access initiatives but we wanted to focus on opportunities for libraries of many different sizes and institutions that might be smaller than those doctoral universities to really boost participation and at least in the u.s the perspective that we have developed is that the idea of the transformative agreement has been defined very narrowly in terms of, you know, sort of APCs on behalf of, say, institutions that have enough researchers to <laughs> justify doing that APC model. But we seek transformation through a variety of models. And I'm going to turn it over to Celeste, who is going to talk about what those models are. Thanks, Hannah. So throughout our work in recent years, we've asked questions and listened a lot and exchanged perspectives across our diverse library membership. And along the way, we've developed some general understandings of the state of open access in our community. And I'll just note that these points are supported by numerous other studies, too. For one thing, library staff sizes have decreased, and as a result, there often is not enough time available for them to thoroughly explore and understand each individual OA program and new model. Uh, our librarians report feeling overwhelmed by the complexity and the quantity of open access options. So as a large consortium, we're exploring ways to address this challenge at scale. OA funding models that are based on institutional research output are not appealing to the majority of US higher ed institutions because as as Hannah noted earlier, most of them are not research intensive institutions with a broad range of doctoral programs. These institutions rely heavily on the content for teaching and instruction, but they do play a smaller role in the research and publishing activities. So just as our institutions themselves are diverse, there needs to be a diverse array of OA programs and models so that we can engage all of them along the entire spectrum of US higher education. And not surprisingly, support for all of these OA programs have to be within the financial reach of the smaller institutions or they will be left out and left behind. So last year, um, opportunity knocked on our door and we managed to create some new ways to support open access in the middle of our pandemic related negotiations with Springer Nature. 
This is a fairly large group of 140 institutions ranging from large to small. And when we asked them, 45% of these libraries were interested in finding new ways to support open access through our negotiations, but definitely not in the form of article processing charges. So we worked very hard. And in the end, I'm pleased to say that 45% of the group did in fact agree to support the new OA initiatives that emerged from our negotiations by redirecting some of the funds they had previously spent on journal content. Although the UN, the United Nations, adopted 17 sustainable development goals in 2015 as part of their 2030 agenda for sustainable development, the responses to these goals throughout the US higher education community have been a little bit slow to develop. But more institutions are now beginning to create local campus initiatives, establish student support groups, and encourage research and curriculum development in these areas. As it happens, Springer Nature has a robust program of books that are on topics that align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we um, gathered support from libraries in our Springer Nature Journals group and established a book fund of Springer Nature imprints for 2021 that do align with several of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, such as peace and justice, equity, and climate change. This um, factored into our negotiations because uh, um, libraries were more willing to keep some of their money on the table and spend it in new, more productive ways in open access books than continue to put more and more money into the ongoing journal charges um, as part of the, the deal. We're hoping to expand this program to additional publishers and titles in the future. Um, and we did, in fact, select the first titles on the basis of their potential for use in undergraduate level class readings, therefore bringing benefit to all of the participating institutions across the spectrum. So coincidentally, the journal Demography from the Population Association of America had been published by Springer Nature many years. And just as we entered these special pandemic negotiations, we learned that Demography was leaving Springer to move to an open access model with Duke University Press. It was one of the most heavily used titles by our group, and we were concerned about providing continuing support. So we included discussions about demography into our conversation with our libraries and suggested that they might want to direct funds over to the new publisher, Duke University Press, and continue to support this journal. They again stepped forward and we um, gathered a healthy contribution towards the, the sustainability of demography in its new open access home. But the common theme in these two programs that came out of our work related to a large commercial journal package is how libraries could fund the sharing of scholarly content that helps humanity understand and address global challenges, which was very timely in the middle of a pandemic. So in the past year, Lyricist has been approached by a growing number of new open access initiatives um, with requests to help them get started, receive funding support, and spread awareness to the US library community. We're currently working with the ones on this slide and we're learning a lot about what works and what does not work as we go. All of these models are based on community crowdfunding by libraries and other organizations such as departments and nonprofit foundations. And they provide tiered funding options, making them accessible to libraries of all budget sizes. And they do not require any payments from authors. And all of these came to life really in the middle of a pandemic. In addition to establishing our new Lyricist UN Sustainable Development Goals Books Initiative last year, we also established a new open access community investment program. This program is a variation of a concept originally developed by the Irish Research eLibrary or IRL. Our primary goal was to develop a way to match libraries with nonprofit publishers and journal editorial boards that were seeking to either sustain their existing OA program or transition to a new model in open access. And we needed a way to provide potential library funders with useful information to help them make informed decisions. 
In collaboration with other US colleagues, we developed a questionnaire that participating publishers complete in order to describe their programs and their business models in comparable ways. And then libraries and other funders are well positioned to evaluate each program and provide funding for the ones that align with their local values and principles. OACIP at Lyricis, this program, uh, provides the infrastructure for libraries to aggregate their funding choices in a way that works well with their usual procurement operations at their institution. And it also provides the infrastructure for publishers to make the community aware of their program and seek investment. So it's a true matchmaking process. This program began in January of 2021 with two journals in a pilot phrase that we're bringing to a conclusion at the end of this month. And after a bit of time for review and analysis, our hope is that we'll be able to establish ongoing operations for OACIP in the next few months. So over the years, we've tracked the level of institutional participation in the open access programs at Lyricis uh, since 2014. And to date, there's been a 32% increase in the number of participating libraries in the past seven years. And this certainly is relatively slow growth. But this trend is supported, bolstered by a 107% increase in the total number of times every year that these libraries support an open access program at Lyricis. It's clear that once libraries engage with these crowdfunding or subscription fund redirection models, they're much more likely to engage in additional ones as time passes and these models prove to be successful and sustainable. Another interesting turn of events happened recently when a US university press announced that it was transitioning from selling a paywalled collection of books to a new program to fund them in open access. There immediately was a noticeable increase in interest and financial support from the US library community after that announcement. It was clear that it was much harder to obtain the same level of support for a traditional paywalled model. All of these examples of libraries stepping forward in the past year to provide more support for open access when they were experiencing budget cuts and great uncertainty um, indicate to us that open access is gathering momentum in the US through a diverse array of models and programs that engage many higher education institutions of all types and sizes. Progress for open access in the United States means engaging, encouraging, and providing clear pathways for everyone to participate. The pandemic served to heighten the awareness of the importance of open content it increased determination to invest in models that promote action, inclusion, diversity, and pave the way to a different future. Thank you, and we'll look forward to discussions later. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Celeste and Hannah, for your presentation. Um, if you can stop presenting, you already did. Um, I'd like to hand over to uh, the next uh, two speakers, Helen Brinken and Andreas Kirchner. So. Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for uh, having us. Um, my colleague Helene and I will be very happy to talk about our uh, project uh, Open Access Network and about how we support the German open access um, community. Um, our project is uh, quite large, at least for, for Germany. Um, it's funded by 2.4 million euros for three years uh, and six experienced uh, open access experienced institutions take uh, part in this project. And amongst them uh, is the TIP, the Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology, where Helene works, and also the Communication Information and Media Center at the University of Constance, where I work. And um, yeah, there are three main uh, objectives that we are uh, pursuing. The first is uh, the provision 
of information on open access uh, at a central hub with high visibility. The second is the transfer of competences and practical questions about open access. And third is the uh, opportunity for exchange between researchers and the open access community. Um, just some short information on the situation in Germany. As you might know, Germany is a very uh, federal uh, state, so there's no nationwide open access strategy in place yet. And the federal states are responsible for uh, research and education, and this leads to lots of very different uh, conditions in each state. And uh, the project aims to close uh, the, the gaps uh, in respect to service and networking by designing uh, this new uh, comprehensive platform. But we are not um, starting from scratch, but we can uh, draw on an existing information uh, platform, which is called Open Access Net. You can see the, the starting page uh, uh, right here. Um, and this platform will be transformed into uh, the new competence and network portal, we call it, as a kind of one-stop shop. And um, all content, and I think this might be interesting uh, for this audience here, will not only be available uh, in German, but also in English. Um, yeah, so far the content has been predominantly uh, textual, but is now it's enriched with um, videos, infographics, uh, guidelines, and other uh, materials that are published uh, under open uh, CC licenses and are made available for um, reuse. Yeah, and now I hand over to uh, Helena. Thank you, Andreas. Um, well, let me check if I can move to the next slide. Yes, this works. So here you can see um, a selection of the materials we create to enrich um, the information on the website. So, um, so far we have created um, about 19 videos that are on, available online. These are partly screencast of webinars we organized but it's, they are also um, animated short clips. So most recently we published a series about um, Creative Commons licenses in German. And um, well, we are also translating those. So um, the last two videos of the English translations will hopefully come online next week. So they are all available in the, um, yeah, in the media portal of the TIB where you can see the link on the slide. And on the right hand side, you can see um, yeah, um, a selection of um, the other materials we, crea um, we create. So we are developing um, guidelines, um, one pages, um, which um, yeah, on topics such as um, how to support open access for libraries, researchers or universities, or um, which tools to use to find uh, open access literature. Um, and those are all available in our Zonodo community. Um, in addition to that, we will also develop um, databases um, and um, on our and make them available, provide them on our website. Um, so, for example, there will be a list of open access journals, a list of open access book publisher, um, then um, yeah, a database on transformation contracts uh, and the institutional options to publish open access, and also um, yeah, like an open educational resource database um, for um, yeah materials. Um, and in addition, there will also be, or there is also a help desk. This is another of our um, services in this information uh, section um, Andreas mentioned. So people can contact us with their questions about open access. Um, and so far, we received many complex uh, inquiries from scientists and scholars, um, yeah, and open access professionals. Um, and they can reach us via phone or via email. Um, and then, of course, we regularly evaluate um, our activities and ask ourselves what works and what doesn't. And so far, we received um, positive feedback for the help desk. Um, 
um, and the videos and the questions we get at the help desk are yeah, mainly complex um, issues from the areas of financing of open access books, uh, copyright, licenses, and quality assurance. Um, uh, yeah, and as I mentioned for the videos, the uh, feedback also uh, is positive and we really hope um, that um, as in particularly these short animated clips will enrich the so far quite text heavy pages on our website and they are all openly licensed um, so to enable easy reuse and um, yeah as you hear you can see an example um, that some universities and other institutions already um, also integrated our videos on their own pages and so we really hope to increase that in the future. Um, so the next section, as Andreas mentioned before, is this competence uh, um, yeah, key objective, uh, so to transfer competences. So for this, we are offering workshops and webinars for different target groups. For example, we are organizing 12 train the trainer workshops uh, to convey didactic uh, competencies, skills and methods for open access multipliers. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, also to build a community of practice and enable uh, networking between all these open access multipliers. Um, so this was originally uh, planned as a two-day offline format, but due to the pandemic now it's like, um, yeah, it's happening in an online format. Um, and we had five workshops so far for different target uh, groups. So for example, for staff from universities or then one another one for a rather small institutions or non-university institutions. Um, and in addition, we are organizing webinars and interactive uh, online workshops. So for example, we initi initiated this uh, monthly theories open access talk um, last year. And these are short webinars about open access topics. Um, and actually one is happening uh, and right this uh, moment um, about uh, li CC licenses. And um, yeah, there are always different topics like uh, EU funding, um, open access basics or plan S and so on. And last but not least uh, for these workshops and webinars, so we are organizing uh, thematic uh, workshops. So um, yeah, for example, for different disciplines um, such as engineering or chemistry. Um, and here, here you can see um, yeah, an overview of the uh, participants numbers of the open access talk. So um, we uh, reached the German speaking community very well, um, which also applies for other formats. We had some um, open access talks also in English um, and we collect uh, systematic feedback from the community, which uh, yeah, is very positive and shows the high demand uh, in particularly on uh, legal and financing topics. And uh, we learned that the um, multipliers in particular find our talks very helpful um, because it supports um, their consulting work. Um, yeah, and at this point, I would like to hand over again to Andreas. Yeah, thanks, Helene. So um, we have a lot of um, different uh, offers also for uh, networking and some of which uh, we'd like to introduce to you uh, in a little more uh, detail. And the first is our online forum. Um, this is a, a web forum for a short time uh, sharing, networking, and archiving of experiences and um, practical uh, hints, which is moderated by experts like uh, Helene. And it's open uh, to, to everyone to read. So far, we have uh, about 240 registered uh, users, and you have to be registered if you want to uh, post your own uh, contributions on yeah, various topics uh, all around open access. And the second uh, format is our um, bar camp. And this was, uh, of course, uh, planned to take place uh, on site. 
but uh, due to the uh, pandemic, we had to switch it into an online uh, format, but nevertheless, we received uh, 110 registrations and uh, around uh, 80 um, active uh, participants also um, showed up. And we um, yeah, tried to uh, transport this typical um, bar camp uh, atmosphere as good as possible uh, to the um, to to the online uh, realm and um, yeah so we 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 looked for um, tools uh, that could uh, be helpful and we ended up uh, by using uh, Gather Town you can see uh, the the room we created uh, in this uh, screenshot. And um, then we also used a Miro, which is a um, virtual uh, whiteboard. And if you are um, interested in, in this, um, we can uh, post you a, a link to some uh, blog posts we wrote about it. And one uh, was actually just published um, yesterday. And um, yeah, there you can uh, get more information on how we try to um, translate this uh, barcamp format uh, into a, a virtual uh, setting. Um, and another um, format, um, which is, I mean, quite different to a barcamp, but also relies very uh, heavily on uh, direct um, interaction are um, stuff weeks. Um, in the first, uh, Stuff we took place uh, at the SUB Göttingen, which is a big library uh, in Germany, where uh, people from all over Germany had the possibility to take a look behind the scenes for um, three days. And we were quite uh, surprised uh, because of the, the high uh, demand. And um, there we also used this combination a lot of uh, positive uh, feedback to kind of um, Andreas, do you have any problems? Format are our um, focus groups. This is um, the focus groups um, were um, planned to be digital uh, from right from the beginning. And uh, for the focus groups, we take up um, current uh, topics that are uh, around uh, in the community. And so far, we have established five of those groups, one on open access books, one of monograph funding, one scholar-led group, and one on self-archiving. And the, then we also support uh, the uh, exchange in Germany between the federal states and the, uh, the national um, um, policy and yeah here as well as uh, with the other formats we of course uh, always look what what works <laughs> and what uh, doesn't and um, starting with the forum one can say that as far as we know it seems to be a kind of very helpful platform but we also learned that people are kind of hesitating uh, to share their uh, thoughts publicly and maybe they prefer uh, mailing lists or uh, the help desk so basically one of our challenges is here how can we increase our users activity um, with the bar camp which was kind of an experiment um, we uh, received as i said before lots of positive um, feedback but here we kind of have the challenge um, that we would like to address scholars and scientists more because most people uh, who have uh, been attending our bar camp were from the open access community and not uh, from, from scientists uh, themselves. Mm. Well, from a, the Stuff Week, um, we uh, kind of learned that the digital format in certain ways even works better than uh, the originally planned format because it um, gives more flexibility and you can even have the option to sneak in different institutions uh, at the same time. So this is something we'll plan for our uh, 
next or maybe uh, realize in our next uh, staff weeks that we can do it with two uh, institutions at the same time. Um, so it's an exciting format, but it also requires a lot of effort from the partnering institution. I mean, we're always doing it. As I said before, we partnered with the SUB Göttingen, but now we'll have to find um, yeah, another library uh, in Germany for that. And for the um, yeah, focus groups, uh, we can say that there's a very high demand uh, for exchange in uh, uh, in Germany, in the German community on um, current and sometimes even uh, controversial uh, topics. And um, yeah, the, the, the special thing with the focus groups is um, that we have kind of more private spaces and secure discussion areas. And although it started very well so far, the challenge will of course be here um, how can um, we, how can these focus groups work with a high uh, degree of uh, autonomy so that we don't always um, have to organize uh, too much there. And there's also this um, last format I haven't talked about yet. It's about regional uh, networks, but I just wanted to, to mention it. Um, yeah, the learnings uh, here are that there is uh, also here a big, uh, great need to, to uh, network on the, the, the state level in Germany and foster um, active uh, partnerships there. And yeah, the challenge is, is here, and this is kind of comparable also to the focus groups. Um, how can a sustainable establishment, establishment of um, exchange and communication with um, political decision makers be ensured. And for the last few slides, I hand over to Helene again. Um, so, well, to uh, complement our activities and to connect with the community, um, we execute surveys and uh, meta studies. So um, the first part were interviews with open access professionals about the perception and um, the evaluation of services and funding measures. Um, you already saw some quotes from that study uh, within our presentation. Um, it's the only study that is almost finished and I've uh, brought you some first insights on the next slide. Um, but there are more studies uh, to come. So for example, um, studies on open access problems and subject disciplines, such as law, social sciences and humanities, and then also technical and natural sciences. Um, and we conduct these studies to find out um, what are low uh, reasons for low open access rates, um, and if there are any service gaps or wishes um, for services. And um, then there will also be studies to find out more about open infrastructure and open access books and also about the role of industry and open access. Um, and um, yeah, then there's another study, uh, which is a survey on open access activities in the German federal states. So, um, asking different institutions, uh, for example, if they have an open access policy, if they have a publishing fund, uh, or a publishing house, or an OGS uh, system. And uh, this survey is accompanied by a summer school um, to visualize the results of it. So um, yeah, unfortunately, it's only uh, open to students of the organizing in universities. But we thought it may, might, be um, might be still interesting for you to maybe to look um, what uh, yeah what the summer school will be about. Um, so there's a link provided here. Um, and yeah, as I promised, um, some insights into the first study. Um, so yeah, we did a series of qualitative interviews. Um, and um, so we asked them also about service gaps, about barriers and also about the ideas for solutions and the need uh, for support. Um, so um, yeah, the results uh, show that it seems that there uh, yeah, like financial resources, legal advice and infrastructure um, that there are yeah, gaps. Um, and that, for example, the um, circumstances at the institution or limited financial resources or uh, little um, 
planning certainty or the complexity of the topic open access and the communication about it uh, can hinder the transformation of uh, to open access at institutions. Um, and um, then on the other hand, um, they said um, how important it is that there is support from management level, that there's political support, that um, diamond open access initiatives are um, supported, that there is good infrastructure, um, that processes are improved, and of course, that there are also more communication coordination. And the last aspect is that, um, yeah, there is a need for support in establishing networks and exchange formats and information and consultation, and also to provide coordination of um, different initiatives and um, activities. Um, well, and yeah, here are our contact details. So you can reach out to us via email, Twitter, Facebook, um, or you can contact the help desk or uh, use our forum. Um, and yeah, we would like to thank you a lot for your attention. And um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> okay, thank you, Helena and uh, Andreas um, for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, a lot of information about um, uh, your uh, networking ideas and, um, and all the support you give to your, um, uh, to your researchers. Um, I would like to um, hand over to um, uh, Jeroen and Jeroen and Bianca and uh, Hans for the uh, third presentation. I'm not sure who's going to talk, but they will introduce themselves, I think. Wait a minute. Hello. Um, I will start. Just needed to unmute my microphone. And here we are. So um, thank you. And to make it more challenging, uh, only the two Jeroenen will present. Um, but we are here uh, also with Bianca Kramer and Hans de Jonge. They're in the call. So happy to take questions um, afterwards also. and. Um, helping us with, uh, with answering uh, specific questions. Um, I should say that uh, this uh, presentation, this slide deck is also available uh, using the tiny URL in the bottom, um, open access NL. Um, and there are many um, resources uh, behind uh, via uh, hyperlinks. Uh, so behind uh, the images, for instance, we use. Um, so a lot of more information is being given uh, in the presentation, um, which you can look up uh, afterwards. So. Our talk is uh, called Advancing Open Access in the Netherlands after 2020, um, from quantity to quality. Um, and this is based on an article we, um, uh, we published as a preprint uh, earlier uh, this year in January. Um, and it's now being published um, in Insights uh, uh, yesterday, um, by coincidence. Um, but um, in that article, we discussed the progress, first of all, of, uh, of open access in the Netherlands. Um, but we also proposed a strategic framework um, in which we not only uh, uh, to focus the future work on open access um, and then focus only on quant uh, quantity, um, have more and more open access, uh, the road towards 100%, uh, but also look at the quality of open access. So the what, the how and when of open access. Um, and today we want to present this framework to you uh, shortly. Um, and uh, and uh, so this framework is not only applicable to the Netherlands, um, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it can be used and applied to, to uh, we think, um, open access strategies in, in general. Um, and we would like to discuss uh, with you uh, the roles of the role of uh, how libraries could uh, um, and should um, um, be part of this. Um, so just a brief um, outline of where we come from in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, this graph shows you a, um, a, a few things uh, together in one graph. So first of all, uh, on the left side, you can see where we come from in terms of um, the OA levels. And this is only for articles, so reviewed articles. So in 2016, we started this national monitor um, and also uh, stating the, had, uh, the ambition, um, the national ambition of um, getting towards 100% open access availability of 
uh, scholarly uh, scientific papers and uh, also books. Um, and, and this is uh, uh, due to uh, 2020 last year, but we will come back to that uh, later. So, uh, and we started uh, with a national monitor and it was 42% in 2016. Then in, and as you can see, we also started with these so-called open access deals, read and publish deals on a national level. Um, and by the end of 2016, we had nine uh, of these so-called OA deals with Springer, Wiley, and several other uh, large uh, legacy um, uh, publishers. And in 2017, we've seen the launch of the National Plan Open Science. Um, all uh, higher education stakeholders uh, are involved in the National Plan Open Science. So uh, the universities, um, but also the Royal Academy of Sciences, um, the Dutch Research Council, and, and several other important stakeholders. And along the way, uh, we grew uh, the availability of, of um, uh, these so-called uh, read and publish deals uh, to, uh, to researchers. And steadily, we've seen a growth of open access availability of articles. Um, by 2019, um, the figure is six, 62%. Uh, percent. Um, and it's expected to grow to um, 70, 75% uh, looking back. So starting this year, looking back to 2020. And I should say that uh, just highlighting a few other milestones here, you see the Taverna-based pilot. Um, the Taverna uh, amendment is a change in the Dutch copyright law, which allows researchers to uh, open up their uh, articles, their short works. Um, so articles and book chapters are considered uh, the final version after six months via their uh, institutional uh, repository. Um, and this has proven to be a very uh, strong legal, uh, legal instrument. Um, and another thing to mention, uh, we've already uh, heard something about Diamond Open Access and, and uh, fostering uh, these initiatives. So last year, we've seen the launch of OpenJournals.nl. That's a national platform um, fostering uh, uh, Diamond Open Access, non-APC uh, journals. Um, and then, so last year, um, had um, I mentioned this this ambition uh, of 100% open access for uh, um, publications by 2020, and unfortunately, um, this was not reached. Um, so it's expected to be around 70-75%. Um, and it's it's of course a very um, this, this quantitative goal is of course very difficult to reach. So as you have seen, we have a, a large quantity uh, of uh, read and publish deals, but only with the real uh, the big ones. Of course, there's a very long tail of publishers um, uh, to take into account, and that's really uh, difficult um, in, in in terms of uh, further growth. Um, then these read, so-called read and publish deals are more focused on uh, non, uh, oh, sorry, corresponding authors. Um, so what about the non-corresponding authors? Uh, this is an issue, and of course, uh, um, we see we've also seen a growth in full open access journals, um, and uh, the current deals are more focused on the hybrid uh, journals, uh, and this implies, of course, um, extra costs involved. So. Um, and what we all also uh, have seen in the Netherlands is that um, had to, uh, to, to give an answer on what do we need to uh, achieve the 100%. The Association of Universities in the Netherlands, the VSNU, uh, commissioned a feasibility study um, and to give recommendations and actions uh, on how to proceed towards 100% um, for articles, but also for uh, uh, books. Um, but we thought uh, that this uh, is a um, nice opportunity and, and, and maybe also a necessity to look, uh, okay, where do we stand now um, and, and what has happened, uh, but how can we address um, other questions in terms of, for instance, the, uh, the quality of, of, of open access. So not about the quality of the content of journals, but the quality of what open access uh, should be or should look like. Um, can we improve these OA conditions, for instance, and can we broaden the scope in, uh, in, in terms of looking to uh, other things? And I hand it over here to my colleague, Jeroen Bosman, who will explain this. Yes, uh, thank you, Jeroen. Um, yes, we 
uh, we view this uh, road towards open access as a really as a complex transformation. And in that transformation, there are at least three main ingredients. Uh, one of them is, of course, the aspect of what actually are we changing? What are we going towards? Um, and that, that could be types of documents that we are looking at, at how and where we are doing open access and under what conditions. The second main ingredient is, of course, the actors, the actors that are stating open access as one of their goals. Some of it even have, have it in their mission. Um, so that, that that is at least governments and institutions with their libraries and also funding organizations. And then there's the, the types of actions. So at what level of, or at what in, in what way are uh, uh, these stakeholders uh, um, promoting this change? And for that, we, uh, we, we have used a slightly adapted version of Brian Nozak's uh, pyramid of, uh, of conditions for changing research cultures. Um, so you see those, uh, those types of actions here, uh, stating something as a goal, setting it, setting it as, a, as a policy, or making it legal or promoting it, or really making sure that it, the actions are uh, rewarded and recognized, so make it normative, or um, finance it and support it with infrastructure, so make it possible and easy. And there, this, this is not, um, we, we don't take a mechanistic view here. It, it's not that if you sort of fulfill all these, that, that change will automatically happen. It, it, uh, it, it's still hard work. Um, but it, it does allow you to look at how we are working towards the change, how we are working to, to create this, this transformation. And for that, we used a, um, 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 a figure. Next slide, please, Jeroen. Um, and here you see that the template that we used for that. And you see those main in, three main ingredients again. So on the left, there is the, uh, the aspects of open access. So uh, the what are we working towards? Uh, and on the horizontal axis, there is both the, uh, the types of actions and, and the actors. Um, and you can use this in any way uh, you want. We, 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 we don't want to prescribe uh, for anyone how to use this. Um, but for instance, you can use it to, to monitor what actions are being taken in a certain country and by certain stakeholders, or you can use it to plan or to, uh, for instance, look at opportunities to collaborate or to see where perhaps some weaknesses in the, um, in the conditions for transformation are um, so, for instance, you can see that something is is legal and it is promoted, and it is financed and there is infrastructure, but it's not not really rewarded and recognized, and there, there are no really no real incentives in place. So th this this could make it visible to to see where those uh, perhaps weaknesses in uh, in goals are and, and op opportunities to uh, uh, to collaborate or improve things. Next slide, please. Um, and this is probably not very well readable to you, but uh, um, I will I will zoom into it in in the in the next slide. But what you see here is that we have built this framework for the Netherlands and make it a little bit more complex, even by not taking three actors, but also uh, just as an example, put in uh, a specific institution, so Utrecht University. With it, with this library, and and we separated uh, the uh, the national funder from the European funder to see who is doing what, and then we filled it out and looked at whether there are really policies in place, whether it is, this is just stated as a goal, or whether whether it's really a requirement to do something, and we have put all those things as concretely as possible. Uh, in these cells in this matrix and linked to uh, to documents or to web pages uh, with with more detail. Some of this is really very very official. Just uh, sometimes even sometimes even in law. And in other cases, it it, it is just a campaign or um, or a statement somewhere on a website. So it can 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 have many different flavors. But again, as as I said, this makes it easy to to look at where. Uh, things are lacking, where there are, is um, opportunity for collaboration, etc. Next slide, please. 
So if you, if you just uh, zoom in to the to the top left hand corner of the um, uh, of, of that big matrix, you see that uh, what we did is for these five actors that 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 we put in here, for all these various aspects of of open access, we looked for whether there is um whether they have a, a program available whether they st state it as, as their goal etc and um you can you can do this for for any country and you can substitute your own institution for that um and we also sort of try to uh with with some color coding uh look at sort of the power or the um, uh, the, the, the status of, of the plan or the regulation or the or the policy. Um, so whether it's really in place or whether it, it has a still limited effect or is just announced and not yet there. Um, and all this information, by the way, is also available to you. So the, the empty template of this framework, as well as the, the live version of, for the for the Dutch uh, for the Dutch context. So that's all out there for you to for you to use. Next slide, please. And looking in a little bit more detail at, at the aspects of open access that we are um, suggesting to, uh, to, um, uh, to give more attention, uh, all of in, in further detail, of course, in our, in our paper, in our uh, article, uh, there are two groups. So there's a broadening group and a deepening group. The broadening group, for instance, pertains to the organizational scope. Currently, that is just the 14 universities, but we suggest to uh, try to include all research performing organ organizations, because of course, people in, in, in society, anybody who wants to use uh, the re research outcomes, they do not limit themselves to what is by a co coincidence coming out of universities and what is not. And the same holds for document types. Currently, we're mainly looking at, um, um, at journal articles and a little bit at, at, at books, but there's much more out there that is of use and is important for all kinds of uh, uh, people, companies, NGOs, etc., uh, policymakers, journalists in uh, in society, and this this might even include things like uh, uh, reports, textbooks, uh, trade books, uh, encyclopedias that um, that researchers uh, contribute to. Um, Two other aspects of broadening are the retrospectivity, so looking backward, looking on, not only at what we produced this year, but also at things that have been produced five or 10 years ago. And there are options by um, mo mostly through green open access to, uh, uh, to uh, further that. And the same holds for immediacy. So not only uh, so really trying to, to make sure that things that are being put out that are published are open access immediately. So with the zero embargo. And in the deepening, there's an, a number of other objectives. So that's moving away from uh, uh, from too much reliance on publishing fees. So stimulating uh, zero APC or diamond open access. Um, also trying to make sure that as much as possible, what we uh, publish open access or share open access also has an open license so that people are sure in, in, uh, in how they can use it and reuse it and republish it and reshare it. Um, looking at alternative platforms uh, to make sure that we can really reap the efficiency gains uh, and sometimes also cost gains that, 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 are, that are possible. Um, so at least explore those, those options and make sure that we learn from that and also use it a little bit as, as a push also for the, for the regular publishers to, to look in, into their options, what they are offering. And finally, also the um, uh, open uh, open metadata to make sure that the the whole ecosystem works well, that that publications are linked to each other using using all the PIDs, and open peer review to make sure that because we we putting out so much more information that people also have the, the tools and the information to assess and and to look at at what is the status of the information out there. So that 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 is that is quite a lot. We realize that, but I, we do uh, um, have the view that these are all important. Not that that you have to have to do them all at once, but at least take all of them into account and and make sure that that you are, are at least considering options to to further these uh, these goals. 
and I think here I will hand back to uh, the other Jeroen. Yeah, yeah. So um, only um, and so there, uh, of course, a lot of things are already happening, um, and all, all, also for 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 a couple of years now. But just to give you a few examples, um, and you probably know them. Uh, um, but on the left uh, top side, uh, the, the more funder-driven uh, approaches. So we have Plan S and uh, our own research council. Dutch research council is uh, is a signatory of uh, Plan S, addressing uh, also a quality aspect of uh, of open access, like uh, the, the importance of open licensing. Um, the just um, released information about Horizon Europe, um, which takes open science, uh, open access by, by default and open science is uh, uh, really the way forward. Um, and um, mentioning also the Dutch Research Council, uh, um, it was last year, um, they released a fund uh, to, pro to make progress in uh, uh, open access books. Um, so NWO makes uh, every year um, half a million euros available for um, uh, open access publications of, of books. Um, and another, um, I think, uh, important um, uh, progress or at least um, um, uh, development is the, um, um, uh, the launch of the so-called national uh, journal platforms. So I just highlighted uh, the four, um, let's say, newest ones, um, stakeholder governed, um, coming from the community itself. So uh, we have openjournals.nl, that's the Dutch platform, what we also have in Finland and Denmark, um, uh, two great examples. And just recently launched is also in Sweden, um, a similar platform, um, and addressing uh, the need for, um, let's say, had non-APC uh, uh, publishing, and and especially for journals in those areas that have difficulties to um, go into that sort of business model, uh, for instance, humanities and social sciences. So addressing these issues uh, on the on the highest national level, I think it's it's really important. Um, and on the right side, I think uh, hopefully Demi is uh, is in the call. Um, is uh, a great example of what's happening in Leuven. So they have a fair open access fund and they fund several uh, initiatives uh, that can either be infrastructure, but also publishers. Um, uh, now, yeah, you can see the list. Um, and this is, an, of course, an example of a library um, now, yeah, taking uh, uh, the way forward in, in, in terms of how to support these uh, these initiatives. And, and just recently, the University of Amsterdam um, opened a so-called diamond open access fund so there is a, a yearly budget available and it's only for um, um, making it possible to donate to for instance uh, non-apc diamond open access journals um, which i guess is is uh, could be a really good example for for others how this uh, this will work um and then um yeah, just to sort of round up also to uh, head in, in uh, there, there has been a letter by the, the VSNU, the Association of Dutch Universities uh, to the to the minister um, uh, September last year, um, addressing uh, how uh, the, the, how we could succeed uh, to this uh, to to, um, uh, to to uh, get to the ambition to the 100% ambition, uh, but also there's a sentence um which translates into this should ultimately result in all scientific output being directly without embargo accessible and reusable for everyone and we think here is now yeah, the opening to uh, to uh, have this discussion um and this proposition that we are uh, doing here so and to conclude, um, and Jeroen, other Jeroen, <laughs> maybe we can do this sort of together. Um, so what can libraries do? Um, a lot of things have, have come by. Um, maybe um, we should leave this for discussion because I can see that the time is, is sort of running out. Uh, and I guess maybe, um, yeah, we can have this for the, for the discussion. Um, a lot of things have already been mentioned. Um, I think the retrospective open access is, is um, I just mentioned the Taverna amendment. That's typically for the Dutch, uh, the Dutch legal situation. Uh, other countries have similar um, um, legal instruments. 
um, but um, yeah, it's it's a it's a very um, um, yeah, uh, interesting thing how how this could um, uh, take into a yeah, into effect. Um, and yeah, maybe the the the, the concluding part uh, on the bottom. Um, and it's not because it's uh, unimportant. It's really important for this discussion. Is of course the race had uh, the race of awareness on importance of the rewards and re recognition for 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 changing the publishing practices. Um, yeah. So you don't maybe some final concluding remark from you. Yeah, I think it's good to leave it with that and leave it up to up to discussion. As I always say, for for all these things, this is this is a this is a lot that we are we are calling for and that we are calling for libraries to do. And I always say it, it's not not the, the the case that you should do everything, but at, at least as a library, I think it, it's good to consider. For instance, for these these six, whether we are doing that, and if not, why not? And if we do it, why do we do it? And, and and just make sure that that you are doing this um, well well considered. Yeah. Okay. This is the link to uh, to the 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 article with Naya, where we um, go into detail uh, about all the things we've we've said uh, today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you can stop presenting and if all the other speakers will um, open their camera and their, um, 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 what are they called? <laughs> their, mi their microphones and their microphones. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I didn't see any questions in the chat there. Uh, several speakers uh, added some links in the chat um, for downloading presentations or reports or other things. Um, well, maybe, maybe um, uh, as uh, Jeroen Sonderfran uh, suggested, maybe it's good if there are no questions from from the audience uh, we can have a little discussion try to start up a little discussion amongst each other uh, because one of the things i thought uh, when celeste was um, uh, talking uh, she said uh, librarians um, can be uh, overwhelmed by all the um, uh, well, the, the, the possibilities and models that are uh, available. And I was thinking if you uh, switch from a perspective uh, from the librarian to the perspective of a researcher, I can imagine that a researcher is even more overwhelmed by all the models and possibilities especially when you think about researchers working together in international um, research groups. Uh, where should they turn to with their questions? And um, well, who, who can support them with all the different regulations and rules? And, and I thought, well, maybe it's an idea to reflect a bit on, uh, on this from, uh, from um, well, the US, the German and, uh, and the Dutch uh, perspective. Is there anyone from the speakers who wants to reflect on, um, on this? Jeroen? Celeste, you're muted if you want oh, to talk. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, I I can say something from the from the Dutch perspective. So, um, I I um, we have since two thousand sixteen uh, these these national deals in in place, uh, and we have also a national platform um, openaccess.nl, which is basically the uh, entrance point for um, supplying information uh, about uh, the the description of the deals. Um, the possibilities um, and it's it's really aiming for helping researchers um, find their way um, and what's also been produced um, in that context is a, a national journal browser um, and and which has all the journals uh, that are available or at least uh, have information on had the open access possibilities 
um, they're indexed in that in that journal browser. Um, and yeah, the, so you can look up if a journal is in a deal or if it's um, uh, part of an institutional membership, for instance, or if none of that is happening, uh, then the Greenwood is an option. And, and what can you do there? Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's 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 one thing. And at our own institution, but I know from for the for the for the other uh, Dutch universities is that um, they all have an, an, an open access publishing support uh, team that can either be one person or a few persons um, to help to help researchers basically find their way to the to the right spots. So, well, Celeste. Yes, um, thanks for raising this question. Part of our ongoing work um, with university presses as, as they publish and also scholarly societies who are in direct contact with the researchers is insightful because I think in both of those situations, they're well positioned to help researchers understand the challenges and try to overcome the barriers, but it's but it's contentious. I, recently, the Association of Computing Machinery, ACM, um, has has posted openly about the internal struggles at that society with trying to deal with their own move to an open access model for the ACM digital library. And it is it is very complicated, very fraught with complexity, but um, peer to peer, right, scholar to scholar, I think is a really wonderful way to get the message across. So anything that we can do to help these publishing communities work within their own groups and societies to at least have a conversation you know start the conversation to talk about it i think we can um help change uh, approaches and attitudes in that way um i know that we're also working pretty closely on a number of fronts with the university of michigan publishing uh, the, the press there and they are um challenged almost i think in the coming year to work more deeply with their humanities faculty at the university to truly understand why there is a certain amount of resistance in the humanities to publishing in open access. And I think that could possibly yield some very interesting results too. Uh, a very deep dive into those humanities scholars, because that seems to be where a lot of the resistance is coming from, um, less so in, in the hard sciences. Yeah, Hannah? If, if I could just add on to that, you know, one of the problems, I mean, one of the challenges in the US is that we don't have, we have hardly any national mandates for open access publishing. So that, you know, it, it changes the conversation with researchers, you know, the, the question is less, what am I required to do, but more what am I being asked to do? And am I willing to participate? And there is a very interesting organization called DORA, um, which is the Declaration on Research Assessment, because at least in the US, there's a larger conversation about how to change how faculty are assessed on their publications to make open access more easily incorporated into considerations for tenure and promotion. So that it adds a level of complication to the already complicated uh, environment in the US. So that's that. Mm. Um, Jeroen, did you, Jeroen Bosman, did you want to add something? Yes, perhaps. Um, just, I, I think it's it's very important to uh, to at least be aware that we are not, as libraries, we're not the only ones providing information, um, and and that researchers are also uh, getting information at, at least from from uh, from their societies, but specifically also from publishers, at least the ones they have published with before. Um, of course, that that is sometimes another type of information and and more uh, more towards marketing also. Um, and and coming back to your initial statement, Simone, and that that researchers might be overwhelmed. I think we we could even say that they are still underwhelmed in in terms of that that they that they do not have enough information yet. Uh, I, I I think most researchers, if you if you really get to talk to them at at least one on one, they they understand that that these this is a, a complex system and and many of them study complex systems so so th so they, they they can they can handle that um and as 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 long as they they become aware that they also have agency in it 
uh, individually, but also as, as a group. For instance, uh, in, in universities in the Netherlands, we have these open science uh, communities uh, where they can dis discuss these developments among each other. And, and th that, that is very helpful as well. Um, so so I, I should say, probably mis terribly misquoting uh, Einstein, that, that we should th things make as simple as possible, but not any simpler. Um, for instance, many researchers still hold the view that, that open access journals e equate to APC-based journals. And every each and every day we have to tell them that there are many journals not levying APCs. Um, so in, in, in that sense, I think they still need more information and, and making sure that the basics of open access information are, are very well and uniformly available, uh, uh, um, ideally nationally, as, 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 as we indeed have in the Netherlands and, and Germany is, is also working on that right now. And, and uh, Liras is in, in, the, in the US uh, has a role in that as well, I think. Um, that, 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 will, that will help. Any comments from Helena? Um, yeah, so um, we also see that in our project that it's um, definitely a challenge to really reach um, researchers and um, they, some of them always attend our webinars and workshops, but the main community we reach is uh, are the multipliers, like the people working at libraries. Um, and um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, we talk to some of these open access professionals in in our study and um, yeah, in Germany, we have this, as Andreas mentioned uh, in our presentation, we have this federal state system, which makes it much more complicated. And some of these federal states already have like a, like a regional strategy and all these um, yeah, open access professionals said that this really helps. So if you have this political support or if the also, in, if the institution has an open access policy, this really helps in the conversations with the researchers. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I saw a question coming in um, from Christian. Christian, is there anything happening regarding enforcing green road compliance in the Netherlands? As I understood, it's possible it's possible via Dutch law to deposit the accepted manuscripts on a repository independent, independent of the CTA. Anyone? Yeah, I, I answered the question also in the in the Q and A panel. Um, so yeah, this is the the um, Taverna amendment I, I mentioned. So um, it's a change in the Dutch copyright law or an addition to the Dutch copyright law which allows makers, creators of, in this case, uh, scientific work, short scientific work, um, allowing them to, uh, to uh, make it public, make it available via the institutional repository after six months. So if, and I trigger on the compliance, uh, green road compliance, for instance, if, if you look at Plan S, um, so Taverna is, is, is really helpful uh, instrument uh, for, um, not in this case NWO funded research because they demand an immediacy, right? So zero uh, month uh, open access. Um, Taverna is not solving that case. So um, it's it's one of the roads. It's one of the instruments you have as a researcher to um, um, no, to get your research into open access. And, but and if, if I may, um, I may add to that. Cur currently, much of the discussion in the Netherlands on that is on how to sort of. Uh, promote that? Will we do that via an opt-in or an opt-out? So will institutions do this for all their um, um, uh, employees, for all their researchers, um, via an opt-in or an opt-out? And we're also looking at how that that works, for instance, in the in the US with institutions using uh, using the Harvard model. Um, so there's, there's there's various roads, and it will be interesting to to see which university will will take on which uh, which approach to that okay are there any comments you as speakers have on uh, on one of the other presentations maybe do you think there's one question in the chat that in the question and answer that uh, we haven't addressed 
And which one is that? Um, the, says, uh, from, from Leuven. From, from the Van Gogh Museum. Can you, if you, if you can see, I can't see it. Yeah, it says, I was impressed by the presentation of lyricism. Thank you. Yeah. Which aims <laughs> to help smaller institutions with their steps in OA. Is there a similar initiative in the Netherlands? Well, yes, in, 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 the, in the Netherlands, there are these, there is a, a, a national consortium. Um, so we don't have that many very small institutions in the Netherlands. There's only 14 uh, universities, including the Open University. Um, there are, of course, the university, Universities of Applied Science, which is a little bit a separate group. But we do not have this long tail of, of smaller colleges. Um, and all the main universities are, in the, are uh, sort of served by the National Consortium. Perhaps, Jeroen, you've got anything to add? Or? Of, of course, it is interesting right now whether we can broaden that national consortium to also include the other research performing organizations and, um, and the funders as well. Um, yes. That, that's for the next years, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or remarks? No. Uh, maybe uh, can I, uh, Celeste and Hannah, can I ask you about uh, Lyrasis? Um, what is sort of the, 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 the remit of Lyrasis? What is your, uh, your mandate? Can you sort of negotiate on behalf of all these institutions? And, and are, are they then offered uh, to, to, to also opt out of any, uh, any offers from publishers? How does that work? Right, we are a separate organization, a nonprofit organization. We, we have no government funding of any kind. So we mm -hmm. are free to set our own path and follow our own mission and values. And library participation in anything that we do is completely voluntary. So it is all opt-in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I mean, in terms of national scale negotiations, we, the US is sort of not set up for that. Um, because we don't have a nationwide consortium. If you look at the transformative agreements that have happened in the US, they, uh, they are often very based on individual institutions. Um, mm -hmm. the, the only exception really being the California Digital Library, which, rep which represents a block of institutions in California, but that doesn't even represent the whole state. Um, so you know, there are some consortia that are funded by their states, but even they can't, you know, they work on a voluntary joining basis, so they can't negotiate um, on behalf of an entire state either. So really, it is spurred by institutional interest and participation. It, it really changes the dynamic of what we are able to achieve, but it also gives us more room to experiment, mm -hmm. as we sort of mentioned, with different kinds of models. Yeah. And if I can ask, if, if we have another minute, uh, Simone, if I can ask a follow-up question to, to that. Um, I, I also wonder uh, how you set your priorities. Are you uh, discussing those with all these 67 or how many members um, um, are there? Are you, are you surveying them on, on what would be their priorities for you to, uh, uh, to, uh, to take up? It's a combination of all of that. Uh, we do survey for sure, but we also lead from the front and the middle and the behind mm -hmm. whenever it is necessary. And we're finding in the open access space that we need to mostly lead out front. Uh, we do this in collaboration with other groups of volunteers um, that we talk to within the US. Um, one of them is the Transforming Society Public publications into open access, the TSPOA group that grew out of a meeting held hosted by the California Digital Library a few years ago. Um, but they're all volunteers, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, there's no real infrastructure within the US to make things happen apart from these standalone organizations like Lyricists mm -hmm. that, um, you know, step in and do what we can. 
Um, and I think we we have over a thousand members. We have a very robust internal administrative operational capacity to work at national scale. But again, it, it's all completely mm -hmm. voluntary. Yeah. There are no mandates to work with. And um, so I would say we work in partnership with the major library systems that want to lead. And then the, the long tail, so-called, of, of all of the rest of the US, um, we mostly lead out front um, saying, this is where we think our yeah. library community needs to be and take that leadership position. And you're also not, not expecting any change from the new administration on, uh, on open access uh, mandates or? I don't think so. I mean, um, the political winds, as you know, shift here in the US just like they do in other parts mm -hmm. of the world. But there's there's been one one consistent thread, and that is that you know there's not likely to be any kind of national mandate that to the extent that we see in other countries. Yeah. Now, what? Okay. Sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> I think it's time. I think we have to close the session so that people can uh, go on to the to the next one. Uh, thank you very much, uh, speakers. Thank you for the audience that you were here. Um, it was interesting to have these uh, three perspectives from the US, from Germany, from uh, the Netherlands. Um, thank you very much and hope to see you next time or in one of, uh, of the other sessions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.